Oh, Jesus. Someone's cooked bacon! Oh, God. What did I just pour into my gullet? I'd have her! I like them on my face. That tongue was huge! I want the guy to be hungry. Welcome to the 10th episode of the long-awaited Amazing Race Australia 2 recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Harmstone, and joining me as always is the Canadian who backs down whenever he gets a blister, Logan Saunders. Good afternoon. And the lady who knows how to use a stiletto as a weapon, Michelle pierce Denovan. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. The alternative for your intro was uh, going to be something referring to your children trying to use ice picks to get out of the oubliette, but <laughs> I thought that was a little bit mean. <laughs> well, you've said it now, haven't you? <laughs> I know, I've got to put it out there because it, it made me laugh, the idea of it. But... <laughs> and we've had a little uh, a little Olympic break of our own, haven't we? We've had about a week off yeah. recording these podcasts. Finals week to do, and then, uh, then we can all relax a little bit. Well, you guys can relax. I, uh, I've got to edit them all. But on the, uh, on the subject of editing them all, I was editing the second episode yesterday, and... Um, the topic came up about whether Paul had completely disappeared from social media. And I suspect you can probably guess from uh, from the introduction to this that he hasn't entirely disappeared from all of social media. In fact, Paul is still on LinkedIn. Oh my god. And it reads just as hilariously as you think it will. <laughs> Tell us. For example, his job title thing under Paul Montgomery is finance professional, dog lover, reality TV star, paperless accountant, and optimist. Hmm. Have you been brave enough to reach out to him through LinkedIn? I have not, because I don't have a LinkedIn. But um, put it this way, Google Paul Montgomery Melvin LinkedIn, and you'll find some very interesting um, things that he's um, used to describe his job roles over the past few years. He's not lost his sense of humour. I wish he would refer to himself as the Great Paul of China uh, in his LinkedIn bio. Exactly. That's next week. No spoilers, that's next week. <laughs> Despite it being in the preview from uh, from this episode, that's next week. Albeit, if you actually followed the original airing of this season, that's tomorrow. <laughs> or in our case, about an hour and a half from now? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Just sample quotes from his um, his current job as a financial controller. To the finance world, what I ask, I ask plain, how do I do it? Simply put, with style, all whilst wearing a three-piece suit. Number crunchinator, complex data cannot hide from the wrath of my pivot tables. Excelling in cringeworthy puns, it helps to maintain the right outlook, capitalised. You have my word, capitalised. I've learned how to make a powerful PowerPoint, to have access to great colleagues, and now my life is looking pretty sweet. wonder when he wrote that. Well, it's in the last three years as of the recording of this podcast. Mm. So anyway, this episode... So previously, six teams raced to Vancouver, where Paul and Steve bared all to win the fast forward. Lisa and Amelia escaped elimination as James and Sarah spent all their money and were eliminated from the race. And finals week begins as we are reintroduced to Vancouver in exactly the same way that we got it in leg nine. Teams must now sign up for one of two buses departing an hour apart to get themselves to Banff, which is a 14-hour bus ride away. And once there, they need to find Wild Bill's saloon and saddle up to get their next clue. And it is Paul and Steve leaving at 10.11pm, Shane and Andrew at 11.41, Michelle and Joe at 11.58, Joseph and Grace at 1.48, and Lucy and Amelia at 1.51am. It's not the biggest leap from getting a fast forward that we've seen. It isn't, but to be fair, it was a bit of a trek for them to go to the art studio and then come back, I think. And Shane and Andrew did pretty well in the actual rest of the leg, I think. Yeah, and as we're going to see here, Paul and Steve really start to it's a bit of an argument between whether the other teams are getting significantly better or just paul and steve are suddenly getting drastically weaker by the end of this leg yeah i did think it was interesting when paul and steve left that paul said that the cops are arguably their greatest opponents now when we haven't really seen that up until last leg yeah and that also paul paul was saying oh he he no longer views the twins as the toughest competition because that's what he's been saying since the beginning so uh, there must have been some sort of trend that made 
Paul think, oh, maybe it's really Shane and Andrew I should be watching out for rather than Michelle and Joe. And this is even before Shane and Andrew win their first leg of the season. Yeah, and I can't remember whether I brought this up at the end of the last episode, but the final five of this season was entirely spoiled because of the departure board of these buses. The thing at the Western Hotel that you see with the nameplates at the bottom, that was out for a few hours and someone got a picture of it. Of course they did. <laughs> so that was a little bit lax on productions uh, on production's end, I believe, for them to just not even cover it up like they usually do with a U-turn board or a yield board. And then another theme for this episode is Shane Andrew saying that it's been nine rounds now and we still don't have people fully respecting us. We're, all, we're still being referred to as the dumb cops. And there's absolutely no reason they can't get into the top three. Which is true. There is no reason they can't get into the top three. Uh, Steve has also been to Banff before and said that he loved it. And as we find out later in the episode, he worked there for a winter season, presumably before he went to Manchester, and didn't do any skiing whatsoever. Instead, he just partied. I'm not surprised. (laughs) You'd think he'd ski as well. Oh, God. It's interesting to see the last bit of this season as well, because obviously we have the Vancouver leg, which, as we discussed at length, I've been to. I've been to Vancouver a couple of times. I've been to Banff right before I met Logan. And then I've been to Beijing as well, which is going to be a uh, a bit of a topic of conversation next episode, I suspect. <laughs> I'm still amused that the only time I've ever set foot in Banff is one time we had dinner there when I was 10 years old. That's my only experience with Banff. Yeah, I've been to a couple of the locations from this uh, from this episode as well, which is fun. Accidentally as well, which is even better. And it's a bit of me- it's a bit mean for production to send teams to Banff in December. And I think it was Michelle and Joe at one point saying uh, saying, "Oh, it's going to be minus ten driving out there." And I'm thinking, minus ten in December, you're quite lucky. <laughs> yeah, I looked this up. The high the high temperature when they were there at any point in Banff was minus five. The low was minus fifteen. Yeah, that's pretty lucky for her, especially if you're in the Rockies in December. I think it's really mean for them to depart at like 10pm and then send them on a 14-hour bus ride 10 hours later. The good thing, though, it, it was kind of a smart idea, though, because they made the buses would have hit the Rockies right at sunrise. That's pretty freaking cool. Well, the buses did... The buses got there about 10pm, or the first bus got there about 10pm. Oh right, so the oh right, the buses didn't leave till morning. So sunset, sunset, they would have hit the Rockies then. Well, equally cool, whether it be sunrise or sunset. It was ten eleven p.m. that Paul and Steve left, and they didn't depart on that first bus until eight a.m. from the Western. And I assume production would have set them up with the hotels that night. Yeah, I can't imagine that they didn't book them a hotel either in Vancouver, probably at the Western. Let's be honest, or even when they get to Banff. Like, there's no way that they didn't set them up with some sort of accommodation. Yeah, they they can't let them just walk around those streets. No, in fact, I think uh, we know where their accommodation was in Banff, because um, some of them were wearing Fairmont toques during this uh, this leg and next leg, actually. Fairmont toques? What are toques? What are toques? Yes. So a toque is what most people outside of Canada would call a beanie. We always refer to it as a toque around Canada. Is it short for something? Uh, no, I don't think so. That is that really comes your weird. Ass. Where did it come from, toque? I don't know, but that's just the word we were always raised with, and then we would have to learn elsewhere that in other countries it's called a beanie, because when you start interacting with with people outside of Canada, you get the same reaction <laughs> at first. Uh, what, what what the hell's a toque? It's like, <laughs> what do you mean? It's just a little thing that you... Bear on top of your head to keep yourself warm during winter. I know Australia uses um, uses beanie because there's the yeah. charity event, the beanies for brain cancer or whatever it is. God, how do you know so much crap? Like, how do you know You know about I know that? things. <laughs> I listen to Hamish and Andy and stuff, don't I? Okay. I'm an Australia file. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, what I wanted to bring up before we get off the bus is Amelia on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to get to that, but there's some some interesting content before that, because continuing the editors undermining everyone with their mispronunciation things, uh, Michelle says Banff. Yes. 
Bang. David Bannock. And Joseph doesn't know what the word saloon is and instead says Wild Bill's Salon. <laughs> well, it's double O's, though. He should know. I presume he's just kind of thinking, oh, maybe we're going to get a haircut on the race. <laughs> Jesus. Maybe Michelle and Joe will have to give up their extensions. And Lucy and Amelia leave the pit start by saying they're grateful for everything that they get, including their names being on a purple board on the sign-up sheets. <laughs> That's cool. That's our name. I'm, I'm Lucy. I'm Amelia. And RFF, because of the sighting that I was talking about, thought that it might have been uh, Amelia and Luke, and a dating couple. Bus 2 is, as Michelle mentioned, the party bus, and it's full of the sibling teams, and they play with Michelle and Joe's hair extensions, and Amelia becomes part of the triplets. <laughs> and she looks terrible as a blonde. She does. <laughs> yeah, Lucy just says, oh, this is horrible. This is very, very cringy. Amelia cannot pull this off. <laughs> The best thing about that entire scene is the fact that maybe within about a month of this episode airing was the Big Brother 12 Everyone Play With Rachel's Hair Extension scene. <laughs> I hear she paid $500 for those. I think that was only about a month before this episode aired. And L- Lucy and Amelia were really given a gift at the start of this leg because they started nearly four hours behind Paul and Steve. And I think, uh, what was it, about uh, nearly two hours nearly two hours behind Michelle and Joe, and they still get to be on that second bus to the saloon. So production definitely gave them some chances here in this leg. And I think when I posted the blog for this episode, I counted up how many times Lucy and Amelia had beaten any of the four teams altogether in the first nine legs. So out of the possibility of, of what, 36 times they could have beaten the other four teams, I think... They were only on the board once or twice out of all 36. I seem to remember it being one, yeah. One time? God. Maybe they'd be... Oh, Paul... Oh, no, not Paul and Steve. Probably that time. Probably in Turkey they might have beaten one of the four of them, right? What, in the second turkey leg? Oh, Shane and Andrew. They probably beat Shane and Andrew once and that was it. <laughs> I was going to say, were they not paired up with Shane and Andrew in the... Uh, intersection. In the intersection. Yeah, because Joseph and Grace were with Sticking Sam, yeah. So out of 36 possible times to beat the other four teams across nine episodes, the only time was when they barely beat Shane and Andrew. And it was just because Shane and Andrew had terrible cab drivers and and probably beat them by a couple of minutes to the map. So once at the salon, teams find out that they have to ride a mechanical bull for a combined total of 60 seconds to get their next clue. However, they can ride for longer than that if they choose to, and the team who rides the longest will get an advantage in this leg. I really like this idea. Yeah, it's good. Because it makes people stay there and it might change the lead. It's a very good risk versus reward scenario because it's a task where you could legitimately hurt your hand and have long-term injuries from it that could impact how you race throughout the rest of the season. And on top of all that, you have to bear in mind that they got to Banff at about 10pm. So they'd already been racing for what must have been 12 hours at this point, roughly, in Paul and Steve's case. And the hours of operation that they're aware of is half eight. So they need to be mindful of actually getting a decent night's sleep as well. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the other risk too, yeah. Sure, you have an advantage, but you stayed up until five or six in the morning trying to get this advantage, and now you're hungry, tired, and freezing cold within a couple of hours. Not to mention the very first task after the mechanical bull is needing to use your wrist to go up a freaking ice glacier. (laughs) Yeah, it's a a very interesting idea, and I really like that they did it in this leg. I think it's a twist that could replace other... They they could easily use this to replace the U-turn permanently. They could have incorporated this in seasons 33 and 34 of the American version where they really limited the twists, where it pretty much had no twist at all, and just use something like this instead. So it's not uh, you're penalizing somebody else, it's you're trying to propel yourself forward compared to the other teams. And if you do it in the middle of the night, then it's not going to affect production in, oh, they're not getting to the roadblock, they're not getting to you know, the detour, at least in the middle of the night, it only, you know, affects the teams and doesn't affect production. So I I like the idea. 
and at least it, the, the advantage wasn't lousy. It was the 30 minute head start with no more equalizers for the rest of the day. Mm. Yeah, it becomes fairly apparent that Shade and Andrew are going to win it, though. Barring Joseph and Grace being petty and just trying to ruin their hands, it becomes fairly apparent that Shane and Andrew are the team to beat on this one. One thing to note, because I can't help but contrast this to Mason Race Canada that has done countless legs around Vancouver and countless legs around Banff, that Mason Race Canada loves, loves to have costumes as much as possible every episode, while with other versions of the Mason Race, it only happens a couple times a season, but here with the Mason Race Australia 2, just a year before the first Canadian season, we got costumes for both the Vancouver leg and here in Banff, but the costumes aren't as ridiculous and aren't pointed out quite as much. Yeah, one interesting thing I did notice about the costumes is they are colour-coded with the team colours on the sign-up board. So like Lucy and Amelia get purple shirts, for example, oh. and Michelle and Joe get pink ones because they are pink on the sign-up board. Yeah. But also, everyone apart from Paul and Steve get normal Stetsons. Paul and Steve get black ones. Oh, <laughs> the bad team. Yeah, and as we have previously discussed with any sort of country-themed challenge, or in the case of Oregon, the mole for the Oregon season appeared at the final reveal location on the only boat that had a black hat, signifying that they were the villain. I don't know whether that was deliberate or not, but it is something that is obviously a trope in TV and film, that anyone who wears a black hat in a cowboy film is almost certainly going to be evil. So I don't know whether production deliberately did that or whether it was just a case of, oh, they're black on the sign-up board, let's just give them black Stetsons. But I did think it was hilarious that they are the only team with black Stetsons. It was hilarious that when Paul shows up to the pit stop in Banff that he looks like uh, looks like one of the bad guys in Sunset Riders. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's the only reason that I spotted that they were wearing black Stetsons was because they run up to the pit stop eventually in uh, the Banff Springs Hotel or wherever it is wearing their Stetsons. I wish yeah, Paul would have had a duel with the with the RCMP pit stop greeter at the pit stop, and if he beats him in a duel, he could say, "You dueled into me." Oh, Jesus, <laughs> you got it in before him. <laughs> He's got more of a chance today because I'm not well. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I'm a bad back. That affects my ability to make puns about Paul Montgomery. <laughs> I had some brother off earlier for making me laugh too much because it hurt. Oh. I'm I'm a bit better than I was when that happened. Uh, so Shane and Andrew decide to keep going even after their 60 seconds is up. And Paul has no doubt that they're going to keep doing it as well. And they stop at 78 seconds. The teams must now drive themselves to the junkyards at the base of Rundle Mountain to find the next clue. But hours of operation are in effect. And it is 8.30am to 4pm. What did, The teams never said what they speculated the advantage to be, right? No, but by the time that they were all driving to Rundle Mountain, they knew what Shane and Andrew's advantage was. They'd obviously stayed in the same place. Yeah, but I mean, like, in terms of when they kept riding the bull, I th- wonder if they thought, oh, what if it's something lousy, like a sponsored prize that we get to use after the season is over? Well, I think someone speculated that it might be $10,000. Well, that, that's not an advantage, though. I think didn't Grant say in his Grant said in his explanation it was an additional prize. I don't think the word advantage was uh, in the clue. Okay. Yeah, I think Michelle and Joe were the ones who said, "Oh, it might be ten thousand dollars, so let's put some effort in," because obviously they haven't won a leg at this point. Uh, so Shane and Andrew then stop at one forty nine. Michelle and Joe combine for a total of eight, and Lucy and Amelia do nine. Yeah, Lu- <laughs> Lucy talks in the confessional. Because well, clearly, whoever the producer is probably asking, oh, have you had any experience bull riding? Because Lucy repeats the question, says, have we had any experience bull riding? Hell no. <laughs> Where are we? Do they just have it set up in their Italian classroom at the elementary school for practice? Kids just getting flung off into the air? I don't think that's going to happen. Kids, this is a toro. <laughs> yeah. I'm presuming it's the same in Italian as Spanish. Yeah. And everyone wants to make sure that they last longer than Paul and Steve, just purely out of spite, including Lucy and Amelia, their best friends in the race. Well, they've won five lakes in a row, so I'm sure everyone was itching just to beat them at something during the season. And then Steve gets the episode title, which is I Do My Riding Better in the Bedroom. And then Paul 
burns them pretty bad by saying, and you'll last the same amount of time too, 15 seconds. You last as long as me. <laughs> Grace wants the prize and doesn't think that the cops can work a bull better than she can. Was it Grace or Veruca Salt? Because Grace goes full on Veruca Salt here. I couldn't tell who was who on this season. Yeah, the thing is, we find out in India that Sam is the one who works bulls and not Grace. Because Sam's the one who doesn't know the difference between a cow and a bull. <laughs> That's true. But yeah, Grace says, Get me that pri prize, Joe. Get me that prize. I don't think they can ride a bull better than I can. I want it now. I want it now. I want a golden egg. <laughs> It'll lay a dozen a day. And then the war of attrition begins as Shane gets a blister and destroys his hand, and he says he doesn't want a girl to beat him. Grace also gets a blister and starts backing down. Andrew gets a 201, and Joseph tells her that they are leaving now. And Shane and Andrew win a 30 minute head start at the next challenge. And as I said, it's a little bit mean given that teams could have been in, in Wild Bill Salon until sunrise. It seemed like it went on for a long time because the band. Luckily, we didn't have to listen to the band music. If this was Amazing Race Canada, Whatever song the band was playing would be at full volume and we'd have to hear the same looping 10 seconds over and over again. So luckily we were spared of that. And it would have been a final memory challenge as well. And Grace's hand is does seem to be in quite a, a bit of pain considering it gets bandaged. And so probably a good call on Joseph's part saying we, we really have to stop now. Cause I, and as we'll find out in the next episode too, Outside of maybe Paul, Shane and Andrew have the highest pain tolerance in this season, and certainly have a higher pain tolerance than Joseph and Grace. So, and I think just with their background too, with Shane and Andrew being cops and and being also older than Joseph, that I think any sort of fatigue they would have gotten from staying up late to add up more time to the bull ride, I don't think would have affected them as much as it would have with Joseph and Grace. I feel like Shane and Andrew have a bit more would have a bit more tolerance for for uncomfortable situations. And also in Andrew's case, he's got a very young child back at home. He won't have had much sleep. He said in an earlier episode that he's uh, he's left his wife with a newborn, I think it was. So I suspect he didn't have much sleep before the race either. Uh, so when teams get to run a mountain, it is a roadblock, which is who's climbing the walls. And in this roadblock, one team member must scale a 25 metre frozen waterfall to grab their next clue. And it's Shane, Paul, Joe, Joseph and Lucy doing this roadblock. Here's the thing. I have nothing to say about this challenge. <laughs> I need to ask um, Logan a question because he's Canadian and deals with ice. Has he ever worn a, a, are they called grampons? Crampons. Crampons. Have you ever worn a pair? No, I have not. Are you going to ask me that question, Michelle? Um, okay. Um, I'm thinking it's 100% no, but... Off you go. Have you ever worn crampons? No, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, have you ever worn crampons? No, I'm living in Australia, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, but what I will say is that my parents went on a, um, a Norwegian fjord cruise in February and they did get crampons to add to their shoes and they were wearing them when we had a freeze a couple of weeks ago. Wow. So yeah, this is a, a very visual roadblock. And nobody apart from Lucy really struggles. And Shane leaves him first. And they find out that it is a detour, which is search or ski. In search, teams must use an avalanche rescue beacon to find a transmitter buried under the snow to exchange for their next clue. And in ski, both team members must ski down a slalom course, weaving in and out of all of the flags along the way to get their next clue. Also known as the Dimple and Sunina Memorial Challenge from Amazing Race Asia 4. Which one would you guys have picked? Skiing. I can ski, so I would have done that. I would have also chosen ski despite having never skied before, simply because <laughs> in the search tasks, we've seen that used a couple times. And, well, Danny and Ozzy did not do too well with that task in Amazing Race All-Stars, and I can't see that task being easier than that in Amazing Race Australia too. Yeah, put it this way. When Lucy and Amelia eventually find their avalanche beacon, the entire crowd around them clap because of how difficult this challenge was. And we've seen, I mean, Amazing Race Asia, they had them ski in New Zealand, I think. And there were some awful skiers, awful, awful, awful skiers who were able to complete that task, who have never seen snow in their entire life. We had teams from 
Malaysia, Indonesia, India, Vietnam, probably, Philippines. And if they can get through a skiing task, <laughs> I, I, think, I think I could. <laughs> I'd like to see it. I'd love to see it. Can we arrange for Logan to have to do some skiing, please? Just for our own view. It doesn't have to be broadcast anywhere, but obviously it will. But oh, just, just for us to for watch. Us to watch. Only because you're so tall. For either of you, it would be just be hilarious for me to watch. <laughs> oh no, I can't ski. I've tried before, I can't ski. <laughs> we discussed earlier in the season about me trying to surf as well, and that wasn't any more pleasant. <laughs> so Paul grabs his clue in second, with Joe in third and Joseph in fourth. Joe says she had a sheltered little life, and she's so proud that she achieved this challenge. Yeah, she was sheltered from uh, ice climb, being an ice climber. And Lucy has no idea how to use an ice pick, and Amelia can see from a distance that she is struggling and not backing herself enough. And she eventually leaves in last, and Amelia says that Mummy's not going to believe that she did that. Now we just get to everyone falling over on skis. Well, not even uh, even before they even try to put on the skis, people were falling just getting off of the ski lift. And I'm thinking, <laughs> oh man, none of these five teams have ever. I think Shane was the only one with any skiing experience, and that was 25 years prior. He said, "Oh, Paul, yeah, Paul does actual legit skiing, yeah." But he was falling too. He was he fell off the ski lift. Yeah, he did. Obviously, he did. <laughs> And then Lucy and Amelia, where Lucy is using the skis as a crutch, like even the the piece of wood before you get onto the base of the ski hill, she was even, both of them were stumbling over that and had to use the skis as a crutch. Yeah, this this doesn't reflect very well on Australian skiing. No, it was, it was, it was like it was scripted. And Andrew struggles getting his skis on, and he's never seen the snow before, and he's like a baby giraffe trying to find his feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah Shane, Shane grills him pretty good for it. They give, he gives it a good crack. Shane and Andrew then get a fail because they didn't go through the last gate. And Paul and Steve arrive and panic Shane and Andrew, but they arrive at search instead. And they get absolutely zero instructions as to how to use the avalanche beacon. Yeah, I'm surprised that despite the skiing experience, that just because Steve hasn't skied before, that they they decide to go with search. I think they were probably worried about how long the ski run was, because you had to be upright going through every single flag. Yeah. Paul would have been fine, and Paul was fine in the end. But I think they were probably a bit worried that if Steve fell once, that's it, they've got to start again. Yeah, they didn't realize that it would be a course designed for beginners to just try and work through it. It's designed for children. Yeah. It's designed for a baby giraffe. It's not even beginners. It's designed for children. There are about six flags. Oh, really? There was only like six? Yeah, there was not many flags at all. It took them so long. (laughs) My personal favorite was seeing Michelle try to put on the skis and somehow trapped herself inside of the flag. I didn't know that was possible. She's trapped inside, and Joe was just, is, to quote Margie, she's just laughing at her hysterically. Probably the loudest uh, laugh I've heard from Joe all season. She just she couldn't control herself. And it was like the I've fallen and I can't get up commercials. <laughs> you know what I don't understand? Why did, why, and, and they did include this, why did um, Grace say, I don't even understand what they do? <laughs> I'm sorry, they slide down snow. Like, that was the... just what I was about to find out, Michelle. She is my favourite in this challenge because yet again the editors undermine her and show off that she has no worldly experience by going, "Oh, I don't even understand what skis do." Oh, as if he, ch- as if she doesn't. What is that crap? Jesus. And then she's like, "I, how am I going to learn how to ski?" Oh, hello, sir. I just happened to fall straight into your lap. How clumsy of me! Can you show me how to ski? I want to ski now. (laughs) Jesus. Really is Veruca Salt. Um, And I'm thinking, the man had no choice but to teach Grace how to ski because I don't think Grace would have stood up from his lap until he agreed to do so. You can say as much as you want about Grace, but her falling into his lap was not very graceful. (laughs) And then Joe is just yelling at Michelle to try and get up. Like, Michelle, you gotta, 
you got to get up on your skis. You can't be trapped inside of the flag. <laughs> it's been 10 minutes. What do I do? <laughs> and we have to give Grace some credit here because she did clear the through the course uh, first out of any of the four of them. Yeah, as much as obviously I take the piss out of Grace a lot for, you know, being incredibly self-centered and having main character syndrome, she does do quite well on the ski challenge when she realizes what skiing is. Yeah, and she's coaching. She was teaching Joseph the proper technique. Well, she was trying to. He wasn't listening to her. No, I think, well, well, Joseph, as we discovered, uh, morphed into a zombie uh, sometime around leg seven. So I guess once you turn into a zombie, your ears aren't as functional as they were before. And it is Shane and Andrew who leave skiing first, and teams must now drive themselves to the Great Divide Trail and travel by dog sled over a three-kilometer course to grab their next clue hanging from a tree. Legitimately cool challenge. I just like how this leg incorporates all of the classic Amazing Race challenges that they use when they're in Alaska or when Amazing Race Asia is in New Zealand. Just they're all they're all just thrown together into this leg. I have done dog sledding and it was amazing. It's one of the most fun things I've ever done. What's that competition, the Iditarod? Yeah, the Iditarod. So when I, the holiday that I met you, we were off on an Alaska cruise after that, and one of the stops was Skagway, which is famous for the dog mushing camps. So we went to the dog mushing camp on an excursion. We got taken around by the dogs. We met them. I held an eight-week-old uh, greyhound husky pup, and it was the cutest thing in the world, mm-hmm. given my love of dogs. But they actually train dogs at that camp to do the Iditarod. And that was the first I'd ever heard of it. So it's the it's a dog sledding race from Nome to Fairbanks in Alaska. Hmm. And they are all certified very good boys. No exceptions. Even Rod. Even the one that does shit as it's running for Grace. <laughs> Shane and Andrew say they're suspicious of Paul being a black run skier, given his performance. One of the twins then gets tangled in a flag, and Grace falls on top of the guy who teaches her how to ski. Jo then loses her temper when she falls and shouts at Michelle. Joseph doesn't listen to Grace when she gets down to the bottom, and he doesn't trust her, even after ten legs of the Amazing Race. And despite them spending two days freaking out about the prospects of skiing, Lucy and Amelia decided to ski, but then immediately just switched to search. Yeah, well, I, I think it's Lucy says, God knows what we were thinking. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's so much that they didn't want to do ski i think it's just the fact that they were physically unable to walk to where the skiing task was yeah is this still a breach of the michelle pierce denovan detour rules Hmm. well they did switched even before they yeah uh, when they were off the ski lift and they were just trying to get over the tiniest wooden slope (laughs) (laughs) to reach the task obviously paul and steve break the michelle pierce denovan detour rules because they switch after like half an hour yeah but I don't think Lucy and Amelia do. No, they're okay. <laughs> Joseph does it absolutely glacially slow, pun intended, and they leave skiing second. Joe misses the two red gates at the bottom and has another argument with Michelle over it. Was it Michelle or Joe who just gets... Uh, well, Joe throws the... When she realizes she went through the wrong gates, she threw her, threw her pulls in frustration. But one of them just clips... And just has one that has a nasty crash. I will say, even 10 episodes in, and even on my second or 15th watch of this season, as it probably is now, I still can't tell Michelle and Joe apart in some of these challenges. <laughs> yeah. This episode and next episode, they do help us out by having different hair, which makes life a lot easier. But in the skiing challenge, I have no idea which one does which. I know Joe's at the bottom screaming at Michelle, but I couldn't have told you which one got tangled in the flag. I couldn't have told you which one has a very nasty crash. And I I remember that this looked like a scary, potentially scary injury in the one split second when Paul whacks Steve in the head with a pole when he's not paying attention. <laughs> yeah, it, it's like a comedy routine. Paul <laughs> isn't paying attention. He whacks Steve and then whacks him again. <laughs> it's like a freaking dinosaur tail or something. And you could hear this. You could hear the smack on the audio too. This wasn't a soft hit. This is a the end of a metal ski pole, bam, right in the face. This is the sort of thing where medical would have had to check him out at the pit stop. So Paul has done black runs before, so wanted to show off to the other teams, and then promptly slips on the ice with a, a comedy sound effect from the editors and hits Steve in the head with the pole. 
and then Shane and Andrew <laughs> complete the dog sledding and find out they must now drive to the Fairmont Chateau Lake Louise and break open an ice sculpture using only the tools provided to get their next clue. Yeah, Shane refers to the dogs as a, as a ripper. Maybe he's a big fan of Kelly Ripper. <laughs> it's like, I, I don't see the similarity between the dogs and Kelly Ripper, but... You do, you Shane. You do, you do. You know what that means, don't you? <laughs> Logan being deliberately obtuse for a comedic point. Well, I never. <laughs> just, just checking. Just checking. So Michelle and Joe leave skiing third, with Paul and Stephen fourth. Lucy and Amelia then get frustrated at the search challenge. A dog poos, and it goes into Grace's face. And the toolbox contains a high heel, a bottle opener, a back scratcher, a kettle, a grater, and some other items that we don't find out about. Bits of string, a ticket to the 1912 World Fair, a signed picture of Ethan Zahn. There are a lot of things they could use in that toolbox. <laughs> Lisa and Amelia then finally work out how to use the beacon detector and find the bag, leaving search in last with an audience clapping them. Was it actual, because you don't see anyone, do you, did you see the people clapping and cheering in the background, or was it just added on audio? Yes, and the clue giver also cheered them, I think, as well, and gave them a clap. So you do, you do see there is a crowd of people watching them do it. Why would there be a crowd out in that freezing weather, you crazy Canadians? It's a tourist attraction. There's no else to do on Lake Louise's ski resort in uh, in the middle of December. I suppose, yeah. I really wish someone would have used the cheese grater on the ice sculpture. It's not as ridiculous as it sounds using the cheese grater. Obviously the high heel is the best option because you can just whack it and peel the clue out that way. Or in the case of Joseph and Grace, ruin the clue that way as well. (laughs) But I certainly don't think it's the most ridiculous thing in that box. A bottle opener is probably more ridiculous than that. What did they have in there? What, What were all the things? Uh, so the ones we saw people try and use were a high heel, a bottle opener, a back scratcher, a kettle, and a grater. But there were a couple of other bits in there as well. A kettle. It would have been helpful if there was boiling water in the kettle. <laughs> yeah, Paul and Steve were using the kettle on the sculpture when they didn't realise it had a clue in. Or it didn't have a clue in. Oh, and I'm presuming it was hot water, but obviously they were doing this in probably minus 7, minus 8 degree weather. That kettle won't have stayed warm for long. No. So Shane and Andrew get their clue out and find out they must now drive themselves to the Bam Springs Hotel, the pit stop for this leg of the race. The last team to check in may be eliminated. Did Andrew keep the stiletto? I presume so, yeah. He brought it back for his wife. It's a souvenir for when uh, when they get back. I found this in Paris. There's only one, though. Shane's got the other one. Yeah, she, <laughs> the person we got it from, she had a very long walk home. Grace is mean with the stiletto and makes quick work of the ice with it. Obviously, the greasy is a mounty cause Canada, and Shane and Andrew check in first and win themselves 10,000 didgeridoo's cash. And they break Paul and Steve's five leg winning streak, which I'm sure during filming was a really, really big deal. And I think Shane and Andrew win this leg even without the advantage. They do. They have about 50 minutes on Joseph and Grace. Yeah, they, had, they pretty much had a perfect leg, and it should be noted this, this was a self drive leg. So, really boosts. Shane Andrews claim that whenever they don't do as well, it's because they have a terrible taxi driver. It does. Or more. Taxi drivers. <laughs> they seem to pick them. Like of any any team. God, they pick the bad ones all the time. And I think Shane was making a weather pun by saying the stupid cops are just starting to warm up. Yet it was the coldest leg of the whole season. With Shane and Andrew, I do wonder whether it's them not being used to taking taxis. Because I know I would have a lot of similar issues that they do, because I never like taking taxis. I much prefer to drive myself, because I don't drink. So I wonder whether, because they do so much driving at home, and because they probably don't take too many taxis, they're just not as... Worldly is the wrong word, but they're not as used to taking taxis. I don't know. I think they've just got bad luck. Just not as good instinct with just identifying... A confident and competent taxi driver versus the one who just wants to drive and take your money? Yeah. And Paul and Steve don't pay attention and start working on a sculpture rather than on the clue, because they don't realise it doesn't have a clue in. And Michelle and Joe absolutely wet themselves at this. (laughs) They are so happy to see the Buffheads doing something stupid, finally. This is the third mistake Paul and Steve make this leg, because they screwed up with switching out the detour. 
they didn't do well enough with the bull riding to get that advantage. And here, they have the worst performance out of all five teams on this task, and they can't even blame it on bad luck. It was just stupidity. <laughs> they were just blinkered. That's the only word for it. Uh, Lucy and Amelia say goodbye to the dogs as they leave the Great Divide Trail, because they are definite dog lovers as well. And Steve finally pays attention and realizes that they were working on a sculpture that didn't have a clue. I like seeing Lucy when she was strapped in the dog sled there. It was almost like being in a body bag, the way they zipped her up in there. I think Amelia said, you're nice and snug now. (laughs) (laughs) Are you comfy? (laughs) Joseph and Grace checking in second, with Michelle and Joe in third. And Amelia even jokes that Paul and Steve would have been the ones to destroy the entire sculpture. It was like a thousand pieces. It looked like a crime scene. They probably thought that Paul and Steve were attacking each other with the with the pieces and trying to stab each other with the ice sculpture, or would it, or it looked like a large husky was or like a puppy was was chewing up the ice sculpture. Bad, bad Paul, bad Paul. And Lucy and Amelia also say that Botox would agree that the heel is the thing that can do the most damage. I presume that Botox was an affectionate nickname that Sarah knew about at this point, because it's the second time Lucy and Amelia have called her. Yeah. I think Sarah's quite upfront about her uh, plastic surgery. Oh, God, yes, she is. She still is. I wonder if it was was Sarah's actual stilettos that they used. (laughs) That would have been hilarious. Here's Sarah's stiletto. Go to town on this ice sculpture. Man, this thing is lethal. Surely even Sarah wasn't stupid enough to leave three pairs of shoes behind, because there were six sculptures. <laughs> and Paul and Steve checking in fourth, and Lucy and Amelia cry in the car, saying there is always an element of hope, but they check in in last, and are sadly eliminated from the race. What's funny is that if they survived this leg somehow, they would have been in the final three. Yeah, Lucy and Amelia were one check in place away from making it to final three, because of what happens next leg. That would have been incredible. (laughs) And I've said it before, and I will say it again, Lucy and Amelia are one of the greatest teams ever to race anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. I loved them at the time. I love them just as much now. They seem like absolutely delightful people. And I'm so, so glad that they said yes to coming back to this season and entertaining the living bejesus out of us. I know some people are bummed in retrospect, thinking, oh, if they survived this leg, they would have made it to the finale. But they needed about seven, eight, nine, nine lives, really, to even make it to leg 10. Yeah, if you bear in mind that even with the 60 bajillion team seasons that Australia loves to have, and even with the ridiculous amount of people that Hammer Ups Lemillion loves to have, no team still has beaten Lucy and Amelia for a fifth place finish. In terms of how low their average is. Yeah. (laughs) In terms of the fact that they are 6.9 at the end of this season. And they are the second lowest average of the entire season. They beat a total of 13 teams in nine legs. (laughs) (laughs) That is ludicrous. And it's just it entirely encapsulates the Lucy and Amelia experience. And they sign off by saying that as much as you curse the Amazing Race for doing things, they still did everything they were asked to. Not particularly well or gracefully, though. Is this the only time that Grant cries during an elimination? I can't think of another time. Because he didn't even cry during Ross and Terrence's elimination. He got a little bit emotional there, but here we, we see some tears there. I think it's no secret that Lucy and Amelia were the audience favourite at the time, and production's favourite at the time, just for their comedy of errors that happens surrounding them, and their sheer insane amounts of luck. Yeah, the lucky breaks are just insane in retrospect for how they dodged so many eliminations. We had the salvage pass on the first leg. The second leg, Adam and Dane didn't understand the rules of the Amazing Race and sold their shoes and barely got eliminated because of it. And then we had uh, Sue and Teresa just get try every permutation for that step road walk and were there for three or four hours and Lucy and Amelia barely survived that and then we had who was next elimination would that have been Ross and it was Ross and Terrence so really 
they were able to just not to, they were the last team to get the columns right without taking that penalty otherwise they probably get beaten by Ross and Terran if there was just if it was just between those two teams after the intersection so that's another one there and then it was oh we we skipped over how do we skip over that Kim and Donna Kim and Donna they got really they were arrested and detained for several hours and the only reason why they got rescued is because Kim and Donna didn't have money and also quit. How did mm-hmm. I forget about the quintessential Lucy and Amelia experience of <laughs> getting arrested and still surviving a leg? So what are we at? Three, we're at five already, right? Yes, yeah, st- then it's Sticky and Sam. Then it's Sticky and Sam getting the must unaired, must vote U-turn. That's the only reason why Lucy and Amelia survived that. And... Then James and Sarah running out of money at the pit stop. Lucy and Amelia see James and Sarah at the pit stop, but just get to overtake them and stroll to the mat because they're trying to settle up their bill. So usually just one, one of those events happens in the season or in the American version now that happens maybe once every other season where you'll see something like any of any of those seven scenarios. And yet all seven of those scenarios essentially happen in a row. <laughs> <laughs> just for Lucy and Amelia to make it this far. <laughs> it's so weird. They are such delights, and I know they're still huge Amazing Race fans, or Lucy is definitely, because she's on your group, Michelle. Yeah, Amelia's on too, but yeah, she's quieter. I know that they're going to end up hearing these episodes, and I hope that they think that we did their adventure well, because they are an absolute delight. And it is hilarious that Seven decided to schedule this season so that Lucy and Amelia technically still make finals week. Mm-hmm. because of the way that they scheduled these last three episodes. Makes you wonder if it's not just a joke like, oh, you know, they they, they burned through the last three episodes because Lucy and Amelia were just in the first, uh, uh, weren't in any of the last two episodes. So let's just quickly go through those as fast as we can because nobody really will be as interested after Lucy and Amelia go. Or if production or seven thought, hmm, Lucy and Amelia go home in fifth? Maybe we really don't want to stretch this out two weeks, and maybe it is better just to make it into finals week. I genuinely think that Lucy and Amelia were an audience draw, because I think the ratings do go down after this episode. Well, just think of the final four with Joseph and Grace. Grace definitely wasn't popular by this point in the season. She and Andrew don't have the most compelling edit likable but certainly weren't the biggest characters of the season michelle and joe unfortunately when you have a young blonde all-female team they tend to be the least popular of any given season yeah that tends to happen so they wouldn't have been a big draw despite being a very strong team and then steve's had a really really quiet edit and then you have paul who is a very very polarizing figure yeah i think going into the next episode Michelle and Joe were probably second by default in terms of popularity, because you still have Paul and Steve and Joseph and Grace there. Shane and Andrew kind of become the audience favourite by default, as much as I love them. We'll get to it with episode 11, but something happens in episode 11 where the audience really gets behind Shane and Andrew as the team they want to have win. Yeah, definitely. Have you guys got anything else you want to say about one of the only Canadian legs that we're actually ever going to talk about in these Amazing Race Historians episodes? And Lucy and Amelia. No. I'm good. I got it all in. I think we covered everything. In that case, thank you for listening to our Amazing Race Australia recap. We'll be back next week to continue finals week and episode 11. Don't forget you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Instagram where we are RTV Warriors. Or you can email us and contact at rtvwarriors.com. Logan's on Twitter at Logs of Quacky, Michelle is Bear 3 and I'm Andrea Harmstone. You can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash RTV Warriors. See you next week. Bye. Peace out and just chill till the next episode. <laughs>